to everyone this morning, and, and uh, we surprised you today. Pastor Michael and Denise and Joel and Nolan are here with us from uh, Michigan. Uh, many of you, for, for those of you, yes, welcome. <laughs> welcome back. Uh, they uh, were with us up until 2018 and moved back to Michigan, and I've been serving God back there in, in various ways, but... Uh, you know, it's a good place to be in Arizona this time of year right now. And, and so we're, we're grateful to have him here. And, and, uh, and by golly, we called him into duty at the last second here, even this morning. So that's, that's wonderful. Always, always ready. So over the past few weeks, we have been on a, a, a journey together. And I can't say it's been an easy journey, but it's, a, but it's, but it's an important journey. Uh, it's a journey where we have been uh, we've been using the, the phrase, looking into the mirror, looking into the mirror. And, and, and uh, all the way back on Ash Wednesday, we, we talked about taking the masks off that sometimes we put on and uh, looking into the mirror and, and really seeing ourselves for who we are and realizing that when we are fully transparent um, uh, and fully aware, then we see Jesus. We see, we see Jesus living through us. And honestly, it's not just a journey for a Lenten season. It's a journey that'll never end. It's a journey for our, for our whole lives because it's vital. Because our, our, our desire, uh, Jesus' desire for us is that we grow, every single one of us, to be more like him. To be more like him in every single way. I think King David. We've been using this uh, this this verse from Psalm 139. He captures the thought very well. He says, "Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts, and point out anything in me that offends you, and lead me along the path of everlasting life." And so when we honestly look in the mirror, um, we, we realize, oh, there's a part of us, maybe a big part of us, that, that still just wants to be in charge. That was the story way back in Genesis chapter 3 for the first humans, and uh, it's kind of something that we've all inherited along the way. And uh, we call this sin. And uh, Pastor Bill pointed out that there's an I in the middle of sin, and that's kind of the the, the crux of the matter, isn't it? It's, it's, it's all about me. And then when we honestly, though, identify that we are sinners, Jesus gives us this opportunity of a lifetime. And that's what the whole idea of looking in the mirror is about, is we realize that this is not an opportunity that we just sort of casually say, okay, but no big deal. No, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. He calls us to repent, and we, we, we realize that, that, that uh, thanks to a author, Dallas Willard, he, he kind of identifies what that word repent really means, and he says, it's time to reconsider your strategy for living because you've got an opportunity like no other opportunity in the world. Reconsider your strategy for living, to realize that Jesus is right, and you say, right about what? Right about everything. He's right about everything. And our obedience is, uh, is it, our obedience to his leading will point us to live like Jesus lived, to live out of love and truth and, and grace and courage. And so today we join Jesus' life. And uh, we're going to read all throughout this week the, the, the narrative of, of, of Jesus' last week on, on earth. Uh, or I should say his, his, his last, the, the week before his death and, and his resurrection. And it's the beginning of what we call Holy Week. And it's interesting that I, I was looking this up and Matthew, Mark, and Luke spend about one-third of their text that they write about Jesus uh, on this one week of Jesus' three-year ministry. And John actually spends even more. It's roughly about 40%. And, and so there must be something very, very, very important about what's taking place this week. So as you've, maybe you've been following along and reading the Daily Devos, um, we're our, we've been reading from the book of Mark, from Mark's account. And so we're going to read from that this morning. And, uh, and we're going to read this uh, several passages along the way because this is an incredible narrative that, that comes to us this morning. So from starting in Mark chapter 11. 
It says, as Jesus and his disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the towns of Bethany and Bethany on the Mount of Olives. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them, and as soon as you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that has n- no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks what you're doing, just say, the Lord needs it, and he'll return it soon. The two disciples left and found the colt standing in the street, tied outside the door. And as they were untying it, some bystanders demanded, what are you doing untying that colt? And they said what Jesus told them to say, and they were permitted to take it. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it, and he sat on it. Many in the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him. And others spread leafy branches they had cut from the fields. Jesus was in the center of the procession, and all the people around him were shouting, Praise God, or the original word is Hosanna. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Praise God, Hosanna in the highest. So Jesus came to Jerusalem and then went into the temple. After looking around at everything, he left because it was late in the afternoon. And then he returned to Bethany with the 12 disciples. Wow, that's an exciting time. Think about what, what was really taking, taking place there. Uh, the, the, the season was Passover. The season was Passover. It was the annual festival to celebrate how, how God sent Moses to let his people go. Uh, you remember the story how they were, behold, they, they were being held slaves to the Egyptian king whose name was Pharaoh. And remember how God used the 10 warnings to Pharaoh, uh, 10 plagues, sometimes we call them. And, and for the first nine, Pharaoh sort of thumbed his nose at God and, and scoffed at him. But for the last warning, God said, I am going to kill every firstborn. Uh, but to the children of Israel, God said, I will save you if you sacrifice a perfect lamb and paint his blood on the doorpost of your house, and then the angel of death will pass over your home. And so since that very first Passover, the the Passover lamb has been selected five days before it was being sacrificed. Palm Sunday is five days before Good Friday. And the truth be told, Passover was a time in Jesus' day when, <clears throat> when many of the more zealous Jews were, were very at, at, a, at a very heightened pitch of, of emotion, and they were looking for another person just like Moses. Someone, they remembered that Moses defied the most powerful army on earth in his day, who had happened to be Egypt, to set his people free. And so now Israel was looking for another leader like Moses, uh, a Messiah, a king, uh, who was a warrior who was going to defy the greatest army on earth at Jesus' time, which was Rome. And so because of this huge crowd who gathered for this time in Jerusalem, uh, Passover was the time that the Romans feared that a bunch of zealous Jews, Jewish pilgrims, might start a rebellion. And so Rome, the, the records show, would actually beef up their army in Jerusalem at that time. So let's just think about what might the crowd have been thinking about when, uh, on that day when Jesus came in. Well, Mark told us, uh, tells us that Jesus rode a donkey. There must have been something significant about that, and there absolutely was, because you see, a, a few hundred years before that, God inspired the prophet Zechariah uh, to record that the Messiah would come into Jerusalem on a donkey. We read this verse. It says, look, your king, uh, your, uh, your Messiah is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, even on a donkey's colt. And then John also, in his accounting, in, in, in his recording of this event, uh, writes this about it. He says, those in the crowd who had seen Jesus call Lazarus back to life were telling others about it. That was the main reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about his mighty miracle. So think about it. It's Passover. 
He's coming in riding on a donkey, which, is, which had been prophesied several hundred years before. And then he has raised Lazarus from the dead, somebody who was dead and in the grave for four days. And Jesus raised him and called him out from the dead. Now, um, the, the, this, they were sure. This must be the guy. This must be the one we've been looking for. So, so as he arrives, we, we read the course that they, they, sing, they, they, they sing, they say the words Hosanna, which literally means save us or save us now. And then they waved palm branches like we have gathered here all along, uh, all around us. And, and, and so palm branches were not just some random branch. They were a symbol of political freedom. They were a symbol of victory. And it was their desire to be free from Rome. Now, those details help us understand this this first part of the narrative here of of Palm Sunday. But honestly, the procession is just the very beginning. It's the tip of the iceberg of what's really taking place. And so we're going to read on verse by verse here and, 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 and find out what was really going on here. So we read, pick up in verse 12 of Mark chapter 11. It says, the next morning, As they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, and he noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over to see if he could find any figs, but there were only uh, leaves because it was too early in the season for fruit. And then Jesus said to the tree, may no one ever eat your fruit again. And the disciples heard him say it. Now, Okay, be honest with me right now. Um, uh, raise your hand if you feel a little bit bad for the fig tree right, uh, right now. It wasn't its season, yeah. And it's a little confused what was up with Jesus on that day. Uh, you know, in this day and age, we might say maybe he woke up a little early and he hadn't had his cup of coffee, you know. He just needed a little bit of a boost. And he, maybe, maybe he woke up, woke, how many of you think he just woke up in a cranky mood? You know, ever, ever wake up? You're in a lot of trouble if you think that. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, so that scene takes place. And now let's pick up the next verse. The tension grows even, even greater. Mark 5, uh, verse 15, it says, When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and he stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. I'm going to come back to the fig tree. I'm not going to just leave that out there. But, but another scene, another amazing scene. And once again, to understand what's really going on here, we have to kind of understand the importance of the city of Jerusalem. Because you see, historians tell us that, that most great cities, especially in ancient days, most great cities were located around a strategic waterway or a strategic trade route. Uh, and that's not the case with Jerusalem. Actually, Jerusalem was built up high in the Judean mountains. And writers describe that it was a, actually a very dangerous trip to go from the lowlands up to the highlands in Jerusalem. You had to co- go through uh, mountains and, and you were subject to robbers coming along. Actually, Jesus told us a parable about that. Remember the parable of the Good Samaritan? Because he was going from Jericho, which is in the low ground, up to Jerusalem. And, and he was met with robbers. And to understand what was really significant about Jerusalem, it was one thing. One thing. It was the temple. The temple was in Jerusalem. By law, Israelite males had to travel to Jerusalem to the temple regularly during festivals. The population would swell to to, to double, triple the, the normal population. People would bring along their required temple taxes and, 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 they, would, and they would bring in huge amounts of money and all of which was, which was stored in the, in, the, in the temple. The temple was regarded as the safest place in all of Israel for, for money. It was a little bit like the Bank of Israel. 
Pilgrims would, would also bring money to buy food and sacrifices and, and relics from the shopkeepers. And of course, they needed places to stay. And, and innkeeper sounds a little bit like Arizona in the, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the wintertime. It was a kind of a tourist economy that was going on, all built around the festivals of the temple. You see, Jerusalem dominated all of Israel, but not just religiously and economically. It was also politically and culturally, all for one reason, because of this building that was called the temple. The temple was powerful. It was a little bit like the White House, Wall Street, uh, the National Cathedral, and the Federal Reserve all kind of rolled into one big, uh, big place. And understand the temple was powerful. The temple was powerful. No one in their right mind would take on the temple. It was impossible to take on the temple. The Jewish leaders, the Jewish religious leaders of the day cared deeply about the temple. They cared that the temple functioned well because it, yield, it yielded them tremendous power. No one would dare take on the temple. But Jesus did. But Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus had grave concerns about the temple. Mark 11, verse 17, he said to them, the scriptures declare, my temple shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Now, I used to think that what was going on in this overturning of the tables in the temple, this really dramatic scene, was a story of a bunch of greedy merchants who were violating city zoning codes and, and, and they were setting up shops in the temple areas and they were ripping off the patrons that, that, that came to them. And some of that is certainly true. And please know that Jesus is always upset about injustice and when, when people of power are, are taking advantage of people with lesser power. But understand that this was even a bigger deal. Everything here is connected in this story. Palm Sunday, the, the dishonest merchants, and even the fig tree. Because you see, Jesus quotes from the prophet Isaiah, and he says, my house will be called a house of prayer for what? For all nations, all nations. That includes everybody, doesn't it? Jew and Gentile, male and free, female, slave and free, rich and poor, all races, all ethnicities. God said, my house is a house of prayer for everybody. Because you see, we go back to Abraham, the, the beginning of the, the story of the, of the Jewish nation. He, he, God called him to be the father of a new community and God was creating this community and he was going to bless them, so what? So they could be a blessing to all nations, the whole world. And so uh, this community of redeemed and blessed people would be formed, and the temple was supposed to help facilitate this blessing to everyone. But in Jesus' day, the temple was all about divisions. As people entered the first courtyard on the outside of the temple, it was called the courtyard of the Gentiles. And if you were not Jewish, you couldn't go past that. There was a barrier for you. And then beyond that courtyard was the court of women. If you were a woman, you'd come to another barrier, and you couldn't get past there. And beyond that was the court of priests. And if you were not a priest, you couldn't get past that barrier. And so these walls of separation separated, caused people to feel separated from each other and, and even separated from God even separated from God. Archaeologists found this inscription uh, on the walls from Jesus' day. It says this. It says, No foreigner is to enter within the enclosure around the temple area. Whoever is caught will have himself to blame for his death, which will follow. We decided not to use that on our sign out front. That was, <laughs> that was kind of a, a wise decision, so that's good. So... <laughs> So only understand that only one person, the high priest, had access to God in the room called the Holy of Holies, and that was, only, uh, the whole, that was the holiest room in the temple, and it was only on one day a year, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The temple had become a racial barrier. It had become a gender barrier. It had become an economic barrier 
to the poor who could not afford to buy sacrifices. And Mark, uh, one of the reasons Mark specifically mentions the dove sellers in this passage is that the doves were the only sacrifices that the poor could for, afford to buy. They had to buy a less expensive bird, not a lamb, to make a sacrifice, uh, to attempt to make things right with God. And all of this would end up lining the pockets of, of people who already had quite a lot of money. This system made Jesus very upset, very upset. And the system made people wonder, as I said before, if people could ever have a relationship with God because there was all these rules and regulations and barriers. Will I ever be able to give enough? Will I ever be able to sacrifice enough? Will I ever measure up? Will it ever be right between me and God? And so Jesus enters this temple courtyard on this day and he sees this messed up message that's coming to all the people that's being communicated and he says, no. God says, my house is going to be a house of prayer for all peoples. For all peoples. Now, that's God's desire for the house in that day and that's God's desire for this house too for this community, that it should be a house of prayer, a place where people, where God is available and connecting people of all nations, all peoples together. And so in the spirit of the Old Testament, where, where the Old Testament prophets, where, who often did very dramatic things to convey their message, Jesus picked up a whip and he goes into the temple and he starts throwing over the tables. Now, please understand, he's not just doing this to keep a few greedy vendors, vendors from making a few extra bucks. He knows that they'll be back tomorrow. He declares, no, this whole temple system is going to come down. This whole system is going to end. This is not just the cleansing of the temple. Understand, this is the, the destruction of the temple system. That's what he's saying. And honestly, those who were watching him, especially the religious leadership, the ones who, had, who were the shareholders in the temple, they know exactly what Jesus is saying. Please understand the drama of this, how, what stunning courage this took for Jesus to do this. And in, in public, Jesus was single-handedly, without a sword or an army, taking on the greatest powers of his day who have deeply vested interests in maintaining the system that he says is going to be overthrown. And he says the day is coming when there will be no more sacrificing of animals. I will be the ultimate sacrifice. I will be the ultimate sacrifice. No more barriers. No more exclusions. And anybody through repentance and trust can have a direct Connection can have a direct relationship with God without the temple. Let's read the next verse. It says, verse 18, it says, When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. Because they were, but they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. As I said before, all those who were in power knew exactly what he was doing. And so they began to look away, look for a way to take him out. It's no wonder. The minute Jesus picked up the whip and walked into the temple, he was signing his own death warrant. He knew exactly what he was doing. He was either a lunatic with a death wish or he was the most courageous human being they had ever seen before and the most one who was most connected to God. This was an unforgettable moment. Unforgettable moment. This was somebody who believed at the core of his being that God could do the impossible. And he was willing to stake his life on it. The next verse, verse 20, it says, The next morning as they passed by the fig tree he had cursed, the disciples noticed it had withered from the roots up. Peter remembered what Jesus had said to the tree on the previous day and exclaimed, Look, Rabbi, the tree you cursed has withered and died. You see, the fig tree was not about Jesus being hungry at all. 
The fig tree was an image of the, of the fruitlessness and the barrenness of the whole system that had left these people spiritually confused and divided. And Jesus is saying, its day is done. Its day is done. Let's go on to verse 22. It says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Have faith in God. I tell you the truth, you can say to this mountain, May you be lifted up and thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. Jesus says, this mountain's going to move. And the mountain did move. The mountain did move. Last week, this, later this week, excuse me, we will read about uh, Jesus' Last Supper, and we'll, we'll read that Jesus was, was really crucified on, on Good Friday. He became the ultimate sacrifice. There were no more sacrifices necessary, and he was put into a real tomb, and, and then he really rose from the grave. And, and then their new community was really formed in his name where everybody was really welcome, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female. There had never, ever been a community like this before. And, and it did come true that his people, his house, would become a house of prayer for all nations. And we're here because of that today. God moved that mountain. God moved that mountain. Now, here's where it gets personal for us. Here's where we interact with this text this morning. Because here's what Jesus asks of his followers. And that's us too. He gathers them around him. And when they're looking at the mountain where the temple is, Jesus says, see that mountain? That's going to be moved. That's going to be cast into the sea. And history showed that it happened, and you can read about the details, but how did it happen? Well, it happened because we serve a very big God, and he made the mountains, and he can move them, that's for sure. And Jesus tells us, don't ever be defeated by a mountain, not a mountain of fear or failure, not a mountain of guilt or regret. Where does that power come from? One word. Prayer. Prayer. Prayer is the most powerful force that you and I can wield in this, in this world. Love and prayer together is an, is an indomitable force. Jesus has only one command here. He says, devote yourself to prayer. Devote yourself to prayer. He says that kind of power is available to you too. You don't have to pump yourself up. You don't have to get bigger. You don't have to get stronger. You don't have to jump higher. You don't have to be smarter or better than you are right now. I want you to do one thing. He said, I want you to pray. I want you to pray. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do, to continue to do. You know, that's, we talk about 28 years of light of the desert. Prayer has always been the, the backbone of, of this church. We, we pray about everything, just like Jesus tells us to do, about, about people, about health issues, about finances, about jobs, about children, about parents, about the world, uh, because God so loved the world. And when we look in the mirror, we do that so that we can pray honestly even about ourselves, so that you and I can continue that process through the power of the Holy Spirit of, of growing to be more and more like Jesus every single day. So others will see Jesus in us, and they'll want to follow him too. The people in Jesus' day wanted to change the world by uh, making Jesus president or overthrowing the Romans or all sorts of human ways of doing it. But you know what Jesus said for us to do? He said to pray. He said, I want to use you. I want to use you to change one heart at a time. So today is our day. Today is our day. It's, is it, just ask that question, is it really our desire, your desire and my desire to grow, to be more like Jesus in every way? Is it our desire to, to look in the mirror, not so we can heap on guilt and all sorts of things, uh, 
things like that that Jesus wants to get, condemnation that Jesus wants to get rid of. We just want to know what's holding us back, holding us back from the greatest opportunity that we have in this lifetime. And if God can move one mountain in my life, one thing that's holding me back, what might it be today? What would be that one mountain that's holding me back? Maybe it's a habit. Maybe it's a place where you, you know you're sinning. There's a character flaw or a fear or an anxiety that, that you just want to get rid of and you've wrestled with it for such a long time. Maybe it's your pride from keeping you from admitting that you actually do need Jesus. But honestly, folks, you're not self-sufficient and neither am I. None of us are. Maybe there's a decision or a desire you're, you're anxious about and you've, you've prayed and you just keep waiting and waiting and waiting and everything seems to depend on that one decision and you're looking for God to say, take this step, but you still, you still don't have peace. Please know that God will answer in his time. God will answer that prayer in his time. Keep on trusting and, and keep on following. Maybe the mountain in your life involves somebody else in your life. Maybe you want so much for this other person to know Jesus and, and you've prayed for them for a really, really long time and, and you, you need to put them in God's hands because it's God that does the work. We do the praying. God uses us, but we need to put them in his hands. Maybe some of you need physical healing or another kind of healing. And, and maybe the answer is to allow God to walk with you through this challenging time as you, as you pray for healing so that your witness of, of trusting God even through this difficult time can inspire others to do the exact same thing. God heals, but God uses us during these times too. You see, our God is still in the mountain moving business. And that might be the most important thing you heard this morning. Our God is still in the mountain moving business. That is the most great news that there can ever be. And this community, I love this community. It's full of very imperfect people, but we pray. We pray. I'm very grateful for all the bright, committed, and generous people who are part of the, this Light of the Desert family, people from all walks of life who are incredibly gifted. And when we come together, God uses us. But you know what? That's not what this church is built on. It's not built on our abilities. It's built on one thing. It's built on prayer. God's love and prayer people who trust a very big God. And here's what I want to ask you to do today. When you think of that mountain in your life, am I more focused on the mountain or am I more focused on the mountain moving God? Because you see, if I'm focused on the mountain, I'm going to live overwhelmed all the time. I'm going to live in fear and anxiety. I'll be preoccupied with myself and where I obviously fall short, and I do. And that will choke out the joy of life from me every single day. Because God knows you very well. And God knows me very well. God knows those feelings of inadequacy and they will come. But they don't need to linger. They don't need to dominate us. We, we, we turn them back over to God because it's all about God. And my job is to turn to him. It's his job to move the mountain. It's his job to do the mountain moving. It doesn't mean you always get what you want. <laughs> Not at all. Instead, we trust. And we trust and we wait for what God wants because we want his perfect plan, not ours. So, today I want to invite you. Actually, I want to relay Jesus' invitation to you this morning uh, to a mountain-moving prayer. There's a little card on your seat. Maybe you were all wondering what in the world this little three-by-five card on your seat was there for. And uh, there's pens all over the place. And uh, look around. There's, they're, they're usually in front of you. And if you're, as a Bill said, in the front seat, you might need to reach around. But um, as you look in the mirror right now, as you look in the mirror, where do you want to see God at work in your life? What's could be the thing that's holding you back. What's that mountain in your life that's holding you back? 
Where do you need to trust God to be at work? Maybe it's a sentence. Maybe it's just a word. And you don't need to sign it. God knows your handwriting. (laughs) And as we celebrate communion today, uh, we're going to invite you forward. And there's going to be a little uh, basket prior to coming to receive the elements of communion for you to just put that card in. And it's a way of offering that prayer up to God, the, the, to, to Jesus, the one who gave his life for us, to know that he's in the business of mountain moving, uh, moving, moving mountains. And it would be awesome. Uh, uh, maybe you've been with us. We, I think we did this about five years ago. I was looking back on our, our uh, uh, records. And we've done this several years ago because I, I found this idea from another church and I said, I'm going to borrow it. And uh, um, as you leave today, you're going to get a rose, a rose stem, a single stem. Should be one for everybody out there. And uh, I want you to keep that rose in a place at home where you're going to see it often because that's going to be your reminder to keep on praying to keep on praying for it. And when your prayer gets answered, and I believe it will, I want you to take that rose and I want you to just nonchalantly lay it on the altar. Someday when you come to church, it might be, uh, it might be a year, it might be a week, it might be a day, it might be something like that, but, but it, it's such an encouragement when we see roses on the altar because it reminds us that God is still in the business of moving mountains and answering, answering prayer. Now, please know that it might take a long time. Your rose might get really brown, but that's okay. That's okay. That's, that makes it all the better. It means that we've, we've kept on praying. God's, God's is the timing, and it's all up to God. And it, it, you might be a guest here today from out of town. I would just encourage you to take a rose with you, keep on praying, and if you want to, you can mail it in. And we'll, and, and we'll put it on the altar for you so that, so that it'll, you know, we'll, we'll get the benefit of the, of the, of the reminder that God's still, in the, still answering prayer. How God answers is up to him. But keep on listening. Keep on listening. So I'm going to give you some time right now. Uh, The worship team is going to come up. And uh, I'm going to just ask you to take some time, pray, uh, do some business with God right now, and and, and, and write down what that that prayer might be. And then we're going to do some singing.